Well, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Bishop Jonathan Alvarado here uh, streaming live from the Global Pentecostal Perspectives streaming studio. I'm here tonight with a very special friend and guest who will be introduced uh, directly, but I wanted to open up as I typically do with a season of worship and an opportunity for us to gather and to come on the line together, to come on the stream together. What a tremendous time, a tremendous season in God it is, and what a moment that we have to be able to celebrate the goodness of the Lord together. I am so excited about our conversation. I've already begun to see some of the comments that are coming in and so many of you all that are checking in. Thank you so much for coming on uh, by way of our Facebook page, by way of our YouTube channels, uh, by way of our Twitter and Periscope. Thank you so much. Even by way of our LinkedIn, thank you so very much for coming on and being with us on tonight. I'm here tonight with friend and brother, uh, Dr. Daniel Castello, who is a great man of God and gift to the body of Christ in his own right. He's here with us on tonight. I'm bringing him into the stream. Uh, Dr. Costello is a, a professor of dogmatic and constructive uh, theology at uh, Seattle Pacific University. He uh, earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Lee University in 1998. He earned a Master of Divinity degree from the Church of God Theological Seminary, now Pentecostal Theological Seminary, in 2000. And he earned the Doctor of Philosophy, the PhD, from Duke University in 2005. And he's been at Seattle Pacific since 2007. Uh, uh, Dr. Costello is a Christian theologian who is currently researching and writing in the areas of the Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, pneumatology, and Lat Lat Latino, Latina studies. And uh, so people uh, sometimes wonder about his academic title in dogmatics. Uh, but dogmatics is the formal academic field of Christian teaching and Christian confession. Constructive theology has to do with the way his teaching addresses the needs of the present day. Therefore, the title indicates uh, Dr. Costello's desire for theology to look both to the past and to the present, for only in doing so can it be helpful and hopeful. I'm extraordinarily excited to have him with us on tonight. I have uh, been in his company uh, at, at places like uh, the Society for Pentecostal Studies. 
and rubbed elbows with him and sat in on a couple of his presentations. And uh, we, we were, the SPS was even at Seattle Pacific a few years ago and uh, enjoyed our time out there uh, on the West Coast and, and really, really did enjoy being in the state of Washington and being hosted so wonderfully uh, there with the Wesleyan Society. And uh, yeah, that was great. And uh, all of his Pentecostal pedigree. And uh, uh, he's, a, he's an ordained clergyman with the Free Methodist Church. And that's a wonderful, uh, the, the, uh, a wonderful connection to uh, Pentecostalism. Uh, when the Free Methodists began, if I remember my Free Methodist history correctly, and I think I do, they were connected. Uh, well, of course, Meth all of Methodism is the is the uh, has the underpinnings uh, to Pentecostalism, according to Donald Dayton, God rest his soul, and uh, so that work informs all of ours. But after we come back. Dr. Daniel Costello is going to lead us right here. We're going to have a discussion and you're going to enjoy it. Call a neighbor, call a friend, start a watch party and let them know Global Pentecostal Perspectives is streaming live right now and you don't want to. We're here. Good evening, good doctor. Good evening. Thanks for, being on. Thanks for being on with me tonight. I trust that all is well with you and that uh, that uh, you're you're blessed and highly favored of the Lord on tonight. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Pastor Alvarado. You are most welcome. Most welcome. We are. We have been discussing informally and offline some of our our paths and intersections and how they are uh, they have crossed down through the years and uh, I am so thankful and grateful to you for being on tonight I see one of my one of my saints and leaders in the local church uh Deborah Patterson is on and when I mentioned in a previous stream about the the Christian mystical tradition uh she said as I, I was asking them about topics that we could talk about in the future if they had any interest and she immediately said let's talk about the Christian mystical tradition I said well okay. I gotta get I got to get the good doctor on to uh, to uh, to lead us in that discussion and to talk with us about that. So as is our custom, friends, we're going to have a conversation. And in so doing, I want you, it, it will be thought provoking. It will create some germinal ideas and some thoughts in your mind. And I want you to write them down, write them into the stream. If you have questions, uh, your questions that will come directly to me here and uh, we'll moderate the comments and the questions, either comments or questions. And uh, near the end of our time, we'll begin to put some of those on the screen and we'll get get to Dr. Costello to uh, to uh, address some of those uh, questions and to and to help us to understand more fully and more thoroughly what we are talking about in this Christian mystical tradition. Well, the, the our topic tonight uh, comes to us from. Dr. Costello's 2017 publication, Pentecostalism as a Christian Mystical Tradition. And this text is, in my estimation, a game changer. This text is uh, gives insights into some dimensions of Pentecostal spirituality that have heretofore not been expressed or explored in this way. So I would like for you, in a word, to talk to us about what, what is the Christian mystical tradition? Yes, I would say it would be um, the witness of brothers and sisters throughout uh, Christian history. Um, their witness that the God uh, whom they worship um, is, is active, is at work, um, speaks, and changes uh, people's lives and changes circumstances. And I, I know that that seems maybe a little obvious um, in, in a certain way, uh, but when you think about um, the different phases and the different epochs of uh, within Christian history, um, there have been uh, times when um, there, there were strong uh, rational inclinations by people to sure. explain things and to um, define things and and so forth and so to have that witness of, of people and who in writing uh, you know from antiquity that's what we have um, in writing uh, stress um, not just the practical or the spiritual but also the intellectual 
um, contributions of saying God's at work, God's at, God speaks, and we can encounter that God in a, in a powerful and transformative way. And so when you look at um, different figures from, from history, for instance, you know, some people are really clearly are just a little different, right, in terms sure. of uh, people who say that um, there's the sign of the Holy Spirit is, is tears, um, uh, who stress that um, God spoke to them in a dream, uh, spoke to them uh, through a vision, uh, and um, the imagery that they use, um, the, the categories that they appeal to, oftentimes silence and mm. meditation and prayer. I mean, that's a, it's a very important witness that I have to admit, sometimes um, these voices don't get um, highlighted enough, let's say, in theology classes. And so you might hear, for instance, uh, as I did, a lot about um, Augustine's uh, treatises against certain people and right. some of his major works. Uh, but what about his sermons? Uh, what about uh, thinking about his confessions, not just strictly as autobiography, but a, as something really theologically significant? So it's mm -hmm. it's 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 a tradition of voices uh, of brothers and sisters throughout history who have said that uh, encountering the living God is not just something spiritually edifying. That's also intellectually very suggestive, and so I think it's um, it's something that um, not only uh, practitioners of the faith, but also those who are really uh, heady and trying to think through the faith should take account of this witness. Wow! So, in so in in that way, it seems like this Christian mystical tradition then can be an intersection between you know this kind of intellectual approach, this cerebral and cognitive approach yeah. that many. Uh, have well, not within our, our our tradition. Ours is more of a phenomenological uh, dimension. Pentecostals mm -hmm. and Charismatics typically tend on the more phenomenological side. Yeah, but there is, as I'm hearing you say it, there is a deep connection between the or, or uh, ways in which it can be expressed and understood and engaged intellectually. Yeah. And uh, it, it, so that's 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 an incredible proposition to me. Yeah, I mean, we as, as humans, we want to know, we want to be able to talk about uh, the things that matter most to us. And so if we have an encounter with God, if God means a lot to us, we want to be able to articulate that well and to communicate that well. And oftentimes what happens is that you know, when people read books, uh, let's say in theology, um, that has a way of, of, of training our, our thinking and training the way we speak. And at times, I would say it, it's, it's a bit distinct or different from, from our experience, right? And it's just that um, when we start thinking and, and trying to add concepts to our, to our experiences, it is an, a work of, of intellection. We are trying to make sense. Of, of things, of, of our experiences. And in that work, uh, we oftentimes draw from patterns of thought, patterns of thinking around us. And um, sometimes those patterns are helpful and sometimes not. And mm -hmm. there's this very strong tendency uh, within Christianity to rationalize uh, these statements, these ways of, of articulating the faith, right? And so for instance, in my title, which you graciously introduced me by, I made it a point when I was asked of options, I didn't want to be called a systematic theologian because mm. I felt that there's something limiting uh, to say that we can systematize the faith. Um, and it's not that I have anything against those who, who do um, go by that title, but what I really want to stress is that the faith um, is a lot um a lot more complex, uh, a lot more generative. Um, there are many more dimensions to the faith than sure. uh, any kind of work of systematizing or putting everything down into a definition or into an order uh, can do. And so just to, I'm thinking in terms of the imagination, I'm thinking in terms of images, I'm thinking in terms of, of really thinking about the limits of words. Uh, that's a very big part of this tradition. And, and that's something that I think has to be lifted up as we're trying to make sense of the faith. Absolutely. Wow. So now for us as Pentecostals, I have tended toward um, at not a bifurcation between the two, but a preference for the term spirituality mm -hmm. as opposed to theology. 
Yeah. And part of that is because for for me, Pentecostalism is as as narrative, a narrative, testimonial, lived reality, engagement with the Holy Spirit. It's more of a a reflective praxis. So we experience this engagement with God. And then after we get up off the floor, after we come up off the from the altar, after we walk away from this season of prayer, then we reflect upon it and theologize in that way. And, yeah. um, and so th- thus for me, it is more spirituality is to theology for me, what spoken language is to grammar. Uh-huh. So uh, theology expresses the grammar of the mm-hmm religious system, whereas spirituality for me expresses how we speak. And so it's it's for me that, that kind of lived dimension. And when I read your text, how you draw us historically from an understanding of the lived spirituality of historical figures, some of whom are obscure in systematic theological expressions because they are not propositional. Yeah. They, they, Teresa of Avila had experiences with God. Yeah. And she chronicled those testimonially yeah. and, uh, you know, Hildegard and, 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 and all these other, these other mystical, St. John of the Cross, these other mystical figures that, um, that talk about these engagements. So, so for the contemporary Christian and for those that may, um, that may be on our stream tonight that are not, that are not seminarians necessarily, but had, but do have experiences and sometimes mystical experiences with yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, what, what language? What what would you say to them to in, in terms of how how uh, learning how to live live out and flesh faithfully out their Christian walk in in that way? Yeah, I would say that. Um, well, going back a little bit to the to the point, um, I think there is something to be said of drawing a distinction between spirituality and theology. What I'm I'm really interested in is seeing how they each contribute to the other. Sure. And. Um, and I get what you're saying about theology being a, a grammar uh, to try and make sense of the experience of, of spirituality. And I would just add, there's also the dimensions. We, we go into experiences uh, with a certain grammar as well. And uh, so when we have these experiences, it's not just um, reflecting on the experience, but what are we using to reflect uh, on those experiences with? And oftentimes it's things that we have already carried into uh, those experiences, right? So, if we are, if we live, let's say, in rationalizing context, and uh, we have an experience, and it really impacts us deeply, um, it could be, and this is this is where it gets really tricky. It could be that we might explain away that experience because of what we carried into that context. We we thought it wasn't possible. Then we see it's a possibility, but then in trying to make sense of it, uh, we might say, well, there's. All I have is it won't make a sense of it, and they might give up and say that it's it's something an aberration, I had indigestion, sure. Sure. <laughs> or something like that. Or at best, at worst, yeah. demonic. Yeah. Well, because, yeah, because as Pentecostals, you very well know, and, and it likely at Lee University at, P- at PTS, it likely didn't come to you this way, but many of us and many of the persons that are on the stream would explain an encounter, an engagement, uh, 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 some kind of engagement with God. Yeah. And we're told at best, you know, that really wasn't God. It's being talked out of our experience right. or in a very, you know, logocentric way or bibliolatrous way told, well, if you can't find that in the word of God, I need yeah. to find a book, chapter. Yeah. Then, right. then, and for me, your emphasis on the mystical tradition and mystagogy as as understood in the early church fathers, I think provides for us um, an additional rubric yeah. to be able to understand and live out our spirituality in ways that are affirming yeah. and not limiting. Does, yeah. does, does, does that make sense? Now you 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 critique all that and tell me if I'm if I'm anywhere in the ballpark. Oh, yes, yes. And let me go back to, to the some of the figures you mentioned. The first two mystical figures you mentioned were women, Teresa of Avila and Hildegard of Bingen. And what's happened sometimes as people have received these voices and these traditions, um, they have marginalized uh, them um, saying, oh, well, these are just women who have these, you know, like esoteric experiences and that's a feminine thing. Uh, but we men, 
uh, we're, we're more rational, we, we're more uh, right. tied to the books and so forth. And so you can see how the different layers of marginalization happens to these voices that um, sometimes on gender lines, not just on epistemological lines, they get isolated because they're not accommodated, right? You have this very dominant narrative. This is what it means to do theology. This is These are the parameters and anything beyond those parameters must be something else. And like and the case mentioned, you know, uh, some kind of demon possession or or that's women or, or um, you know, just it, they explain it away. They, they, and so this is the thing I would say to, to the query you mentioned previously. I want to urge everybody um, who, who has uh, mystical experiences, who, who has this deep sense of, of, of an abiding presence of God, that that is intellectually important. Mm. Mm. I really want to stress that. It's intellectually important important and wow. anybody that tells you that it's intellectually not they not you they are limited in what they're defining as intellectually viable uh, it's mm. intellectually important and if you look at the history of these figures some of the greatest figures in christian antiquity had mystical experience let's go back to paul right yeah. Had a mystical experience, and people like to read Romans, and they like to read, you know, oh, he's the first systematic theologian. Um, you can make the case that he was one of the first uh, Christian mystics. Uh, Absolutely. People don't want to highlight that about him. They oftentimes say, oh, well, he's a theologian. Look at Romans and how he developed narrating the faith in the different chapters. That's a way of thinking about it for sure. But what was driving what he was saying in Romans and the care he had for the people and, and the vision that he had of the resurrected Lord? Uh, it, it, it's that mystical encounter that changed him from being uh, Saul to Paul, right? And it was those mystical encounters that fueled his theology. If we look at the Romans, because you know many of us that were the, the, were oriented to an FF Bruce kind of understanding of Romans see him as this kind of systematic theologian. But there are other ways of, of viewing that. And the reality is, is that it is his mystical experiences caught up in third heavens and things that informed his theological propositions. Yes. And so I, I, I appreciate that affirmation for so many. Because I think that not only you mentioned it in the context of of a of a, of a oftentimes a, a gender categorization, but it's also I mean there are some ontological and epistemological concerns that different ethnic groups bring to the table in right. terms of the way we theologize, the way we appreciate the world, the way we engage with the world, and those kinds. So this the communal nature of African and and for for us I mean uh, Latino sensibilities are oftentimes in in the West influenced by African sensibilities through the slave trade. And so I'm looking at those various dimensions of how we theologize, and it rejects and resists uh, in a very real way some of the European understandings oh, of, yeah. the, uh, of, of, of appropriate, this is the right, right way to theologize. And so I, I appreciate that, that dimension of that as you bring that out. Yeah, that, that's partly why I was mentioning earlier about, you know, we bring these things to the table um, in terms of the grammar. Then we have the experience with God. And then if we go to a particular educational context, uh, we can't bring our grammars that we had to try to make sense of the experience because we're told that, that those grammars don't make, aren't valid. And so we have to pick up a different grammar and that grammar just doesn't, doesn't help or it's not compelling. And as a result, I think it diminished the witness, diminishes the witness of Christians across the globe because they're told essentially, they might not, they not be, may not be explicit, but they are told uh, essentially to do theology well, you have to do it as a Westerner, right? Absolutely. And that's very problematic. Absolutely. Um, it's too early to start bringing in comments, but but uh, Doctor, the Reverend Doctor, uh, the Reverend Bishop, Doctor Trevor Alexander, uh, in San Antonio, Texas, he teaches at Oblate uh, uh, College there in uh, uh, in San Antonio. Said, I think when we talk about Pentecostalism, we tend to start at Azusa Street. But I'm glad to hear the conversation dealing with the early church fathers and some of the early mothers of the church. So, and this is some of the genius of your work in that it goes past. 1906, it ties us beyond the uh, 1517, uh, the Protestant Reformation, and, and, and pushes us further back into the church Catholic, all the way back into the patristic period, and makes us, forces us to reckon with both the historical trajectories that brought us to this place, 
but also with the theological developments associated with those trajectories. Mm -hmm. So how is it that you came to develop an, uh, 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 hold on a second. Okay, good. Michael Young, one of my students, now colleagues, they say mystical experiences are intellectually viable. That's a really good insight. Because oftentimes, as Pentecostal intellectuals, we're oftentimes put in some arenas where we have to choose between the two. Right. right. And, and that's, that's, that's where we have to be very critical and say the way that the arenas are configured, um, that in itself is problematic. Right. And that's hard to do. Um, because, of course, we want to um, have our voices heard and we want to um, uh, be able to work within those arenas. But those arenas come from somewhere. Somebody established them or some group of people established them. And those the limits, there are limits to those arenas themselves. And, you know, as, as a Pentecostal, for a lot of people, that's an oxymoron, right? Uh, but, it, <laughs> right, right, right. But, but it is a reality. Yeah. It's like like jumbo shrimp or or <laughs> compassionate conservative. I'm just saying these are oxymorons, you know. You yeah. know per, per cost of scholar, I don't know. Well, and the thing is, is that all right? You think it's an oxymoron? Well, here here I I'm embodying this. Absolutely, right? we're embodying this. Uh, so it's not Im impossible. It's a reality that that can be lived out. And so yes. Yeah, if you look at some of the papers in Azusa, they they were making some of these claims too. Um, not not very prominently, but they were saying, you know, there are some movements of the spirit in previous centuries, and this is this is in continuity with this. But yes, what happens oftentimes, and um, I don't want to critique too much here, but what happens oftentimes is that there, uh, in narrations of Pentecostal identity, becomes very Azusa centric. And uh, to assume that, all right, so at Azusa, we have um, something really uh, prominent, something new, something impactful. Uh, and so that's where we start. And of course, that doesn't account for some of the revivals that happened in the immediate years prior to Azusa. But that's just theologically very um, difficult because uh, if, we're, if we really believe the claim that the, the God we worship is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then mm. there is a sense in which what Pentecostals experience of God cannot be just relegated to the last 120 years or so. And so uh, to be able to, to say, all right, uh, they might not have some of the same doctrines. They might not have the same understandings specifically. Uh, but in terms of, of what they're saying broadly about, um, about their encounters with God and what it means, uh, that's what ultimately drew me to these authors is that when I'm, I'm reading Isaac of Nineveh uh, or when I'm reading Gregory of Nyssa and they're speaking of, 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 of encounters with God uh, in which uh, they're, they're using very visceral language, very loaded um, images, uh, heartfelt sense of, of that, that the experience of God matters and it changes things. Well, that, that's, that's where we are, right? And so we can find those affinities and claim them and, and in turn make a deeper contribution to, to the water theological community and say, why are you ignoring these voices? Uh, why are you um, marginalizing them? Um, you know, you look at the controversial uh, treatises uh, against heretics, but you don't look at, at the sermons or on the treatises on prayer. Uh, that's just as valid, uh, if not more so. And so it's a witness to sustain. It's just that going against trends, uh, going against um, establishments, um, it's really hard, uh, but I think it's a, it's a very much a space that, uh, Pentecostals and Charismatics can inhabit and say, there's all of this, these aspects of our tradition as Christians that we need to lift up and to recognize as, as valuable for us today. Which is one of the reasons that I felt like your work was so prophetic in the sense that it is a proleptic view toward what the church could be. Yeah. If we were to tie and not be disparate and disjointed, maybe we could live the reality of Christ's prayer in John 17, that we were historically and presently and futuristically made one, yeah. that we see the meta narrative of God at work throughout history, maybe not in exacting ways, but in similar ways and similar iterations. So that way we don't necessarily have to dismiss a whole group of Christians because they haven't we Pentecostals haven't 
uh, uh, fit in with the um, with some of the uh, dogmatic requirements and, and of orthodoxy as as has been prescribed to us by some. So this is that's why I'm advocating gang for this book. Everybody that's watching, thank you for being on. Uh, like and subscribe. And uh, uh, please, uh, if you even if you're on Facebook, go over to my YouTube channel, Global Pentecostal Perspectives. I need by the end of this month. I mean by the. Um, uh, by the end of this month, yes, I need to have at least a hundred subscribers to that. To that, it's, I just got the channel started a couple of weeks ago, and I, I'm I'm up to about eighty some odd subscribers. I want to be over a hundred at the end of this month, and and uh, and uh, upwards of a thousand by the end of the year. And you can help us do that if you will like and subscribe. If you're getting value out of this. Uh, conversation as I am on tonight. I'm resisting the temptation to just wax in this uh, theological egghead uh, kind of way that I can. Because uh, when you start talking about Greg, uh, uh, yes, uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa and uh, Greg of, Gregory of Nazianzus and Basil the Great, um, these Cappadocian fathers, um, you know, I can't but help but resist, I can't resist the temptation to slide in there who were taught by their older sister Macrina and right. everything that they knew about theology uh, uh, they learned from their big sister. And so this idea of mysticism, again, being tied to some of the great women of theological and church history, I think it's an important thing that should not be should not be glossed over, uh, as you have pointed out so so wonderfully uh, previously. So, so then when and how did you begin to see uh, the connections with the Christian mystical tradition with Pentecostal spirituality in, in a more formal or academic way? When did you start seeing, um, when did the light start coming on for you or the connections of the dots start being, being made for you in, 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 as that led you into this kind of academic pursuit? Well, I think we live in a very um, beautiful moment um, in terms of Pentecostal scholarship um, because I was uh, coming into um, my development theologically after uh, some pioneers uh, in the early 90s, uh, we're, we're really producing some important uh, generative uh, works in theology. And so where I went to seminary, uh, were some uh, important voices there um, uh, that were basically saying, well, there's a Pentecostal way to do uh, theology, a Pentecostal way to do uh, Christian formation, a Pentecostal way to read scripture. And all of that was, was driven by a certain kind of uh, well, given our experience, this is what we're led to do intellectually, and we know it's in tension with uh, other other traditions of investigation or other traditions of thought. And so that was the context in which I was uh, raised, is to say, all right, so um, we don't have to carry the, uh, or we don't have to perpetuate the standard accounts. There are other accounts um, that, that are available. And so then as I started reading um, from different voices, um, from the Christian past, I, I started to realize, wow, well, there are uh, quite a few figures and quite a few works that don't get highlighted, but they are precisely um, mentioning things um, that that correspond pretty well uh, to to this, these experiences. And so, when you say, for instance, a Pentecostal way of reading Scripture. Um, that sounds very similar to uh, an ancient tradition of reading scripture called Lectio Divina, in which you encounter, you read scripture so as to encounter the living God. It's a Pentecostal way of doing, uh, of interpreting scripture. It's also uh, a way that uh, the ancients read scripture too. And so I started to see these connections uh, that mm. Pentecostals were resisting at a certain level in terms of the way that different theological disciplines have been shaped. Um, the way they were resisting it and the way that they were appealing to uh, alternatives, those very alternatives were not new in some sense, but that they were ancient. They had just been neglected. And so that started to pique my interest. Well, if that's the case with things like reading scripture, what else is out there? I just realized oh, there, there, there's, there's so much more um, that can possibly be uh, there that just people aren't talking about. And so as I, I did a deep dive um, personally and, and also in a scholarly way into a lot of these voices, I realized, okay, so my experience as a Pentecostal, my experience as a, as, as a person living from this uh, experience uh, of a movement that oftentimes people say just happened within the last 120 years, it's actually not unique in a certain sense. It actually well, is the experience of the Christian God 
that others have had too. They might have used different language to explain it or to try to figure it out or, or different things were happening in their place, but their experiences are very similar in terms of, uh, of what they end up saying, uh, confessing and feeling in their souls. And so, mm -hmm. um, what, what really, um, what, what, was accomplished by that for me was, okay, so I'm really part of a large tradition. It's not just the last 120 years. This is a tradition that spans centuries. And um, it really, this sounds a little strange, it really helped me to see you can define Christianity and define Christian theology in many different ways. Sure. And sure. I, I know that's a little hard to take, for instance, because sure. um, you know, you're using the same language, Christian. Um, but there are people who live out their Christianity, who define Christianity in different ways uh, than I would, um, and based on uh, this witness of, of various figures and based on how, how we read scripture. It's the same scripture in a sense, um, but how and what's the point of reading it and, and what are we looking to accomplish and so forth. So recognizing that there, there's that variety, but no, recognizing also it's not something new, it's ancient. Uh, sure. It really made me rethink and, and really be re-enchanted, if I can say, with what it means to be a Christian. That is such a powerful, powerful insight. Um, I've oftentimes said, and have come under some criticism, when I've said that Christianity is, is ultimately a cultural expression and uh, how it's expressed in cultures and how cultures understand and appreciate and engage with the living God. Yeah. I often say that the scripture bears witness that when the earth was being formed, that the spirit brooded over the face of the waters. So the spirit has always been present in a hovering, brooding kind of way. And ours has been the assignment and the task to appropriate unto that spirit so that way we can, so that way we can, we can, um, you know, we, well, well, uh, uh, two, two comments that are really worth, worth putting up, uh, up, up at this point. Uh, my bride, uh, Dr. Tony Alvarado said, I appreciate the lifting of women in the mystical tradition. This helps me understand women like my grandmother, who often spoke of her experiences with the spirit in testimony services at church yeah. and in her conversations with family and friends. Yeah. And if I might add, uh, Grandma Shodi didn't have theological language to articulate those expressions. Right. Yet she said something beyond this, this engagement there along that wise and search she articulates that. Right. Still um, intellectually suggestive. That's it. So sure. Sure. No, no fault to, to, uh, of her own. She may not have had the language, but it's still theologically suggestive to hear her witness and to say, all right, so how does that then inform my sense of what it means to articulate, to understand the God that we, we worship, right? So when I hear people narrating their experiences or talking about their encounters with God, um, you know, I try to keep an open mind uh, and I try to say, all right, let's, let's, let's see where this goes. Um, mm. because it, it, it could be the case that it's a little strange. It could be a little case of counterintuitive. Hold on. Guess, hold on. The, you mean tell me, you don't say, show me that in the Bible? Where's that in the Bible? <laughs> that in the Bible? So that's what they do to me all the time. They what? tell me, show me that. And, 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 and I, you know, I, I try not to be unkind or snarky, but, you know, but it, though it's, it, though, what, 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 what did uh, Jerome uh, it, it, it's not, though it's not stated, it's reality is all around us. I am. Yeah. Well, that's With, the thing. That's the thing. It's just, uh, you know, what, what testament do we give of, of, of the living Christ? It's, it's our lives and, and how we, mm. um, participate in this faith, right? It's just so, um, you know, if we're talking about a person who is deeply connected to the presence of, of God, who, um, prays regularly, uh, who shows the virtues of Christ and the gifts of the Spirit on a regular basis, uh, then when they say things like, you know, I, I had a vision or I had a dream, um, they have a certain weight or a gravitas that I'm going to recognize as, all right, let's hear what this is, right? Yes. And let's, 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 yes, we do need to evaluate as with anything. I mean, we need to discern as with anything, but this person's witness, this person's spiritual a seriousness gives me um, the, the the kind of push to to give them the benefit of the doubt and let's hear it out, right? Absolutely. And 
And I, I tell you, sometimes it's happened where uh, my my intellectual orientation has shifted because of those kinds of testimonies, right? Uh, when people say, oh, well, you just, you, there's this sense where you just know, or there's a sense in which um, uh, God's doing this, but we can't articulate, I can't say it, but there's something there. I take those things very seriously, especially if I know the person who's saying it and say, all right, I'm, I'm going to, to let this simmer. I'm going to let this uh, um, uh, sit there and let's see. And oftentimes it's been the case that it, I, I, I would confess it was the Lord working through that person. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really, um, that's, what we Christians need to live this life faithfully and well is, is to have the witness of people who um, hear God and can speak uh, the words of God in a meaningful way in our lives. That's what sustains us as a community. So um, I, I find it very sad uh, that um, sometimes those voices are, are marginalized or diminished because they don't have an academic title or they don't have a degree. Um, because there's some things that you learn on your knees that you can't learn any other way. Yes, sir. And, I, and I'm convinced by that. Mm, mm, mm. And I, th I think that's such a powerful, powerful insight that the democratization, the democratizing presence of the spirit, uh -huh. that, that the spirit democratizes the work. That So it's, it's men like you or me who've had the benefit of academic training can then sit in the company of men and women and children yes. who suffer. Sons and daughters can prophesy Absolutely. and share with us great insights. Uh, it's too early for questions. I'm going to give five or seven more questions, but I got to let Bishop Kroon's question come in because it's so appropriate for where we are right now. Can we say, this is Bishop Arthur Kroon, can we say that Christianity is oftentimes fleshed uh, out through our cultural experiences? Yeah, I think that um, there's, there's, no, there's no way to separate our, our, our sense of self as a cultured self from our spiritual experiences. They go hand in hand. So when, when you mention critics uh, who, who would say to you uh, about, about culture, I mean, there is no alternative. We are cultured beings. Just like the language that we speak, um, uh, the way that we think, uh, the way that we interact with one another, that's culture. And we are cultured beings. There's no escaping culture. And so instead of making the bifurcation uh, sometimes of Christianity on this side and and culture on the other, it, it's right. a very unfortunate um, uh, dichotomy because it's it's there's always culture. We we are cultured selves, right? And so um, now God works in our culture, uh, cultured selves. God works in the midst of uh, of, of human dynamics, and um, instead of this quest of trying to say, all right, so what's what's God and what's culture. The reality is it's messy and it always has been and it always will be because if God works in our context, if God works through people, it's also going to be through culture. Um, and just, and so I would add further, the idea that you could separate culture and, and make that partition pretty pronounced between culture and Christianity, that in itself is an intellectual orientation. Uh, it sounds very mm -hmm. Very, very Western, uh, frankly, uh, that you can make that partition on the basis of what can you? Um, it's it's mm -hmm. not very, very much like um, in, a, in a broad sense, uh, a kind of Gnosticism, right? And say that, all right, so right. There, you can separate, right. disentangle right. Um, culture and bodies from the gospel and, and somehow the gospel is, is unadulterated and and somehow heady and and then when you go to the, that extreme and so what so the heady part what would that be that would be concepts and definitions and so forth and you're separating now the gospel from life right but very much we have an incarnate jesus amen and amen, amen, amen. having an incarnate jesus means that it, it, it's not that first century uh, palestinians are somehow holier uh, than than others, but to understand Jesus, you have to understand first century Palestinian Judaism. You just that's that's it, and to understand ourselves, we have to understanding yeah, absolutely uh, the examples that he appeals to uh, in his parables, the language that he's using, uh, the thought forms that make sense to the people at the time. That's all cultured, and so if we want to understand uh, what God is doing in the world, what God reveals to us. Um, that's in the mix, absolutely.
Absolutely. D Dr. May Alice Reggie says, in his book, Eternity in Their Hearts, Richardson says, God has placed a witness to himself in every culture. Mm. Well, I think going back to your point, Pastor, about um, I think that point can be stressed very much in a pneumatological way. Yes. Right? And, and it's that if we are uh, creatures of the spirit, um, if we're all created in the image of God, and um, if we think of the image of God um, in some sense as, as spirit related, then yes, I think that that's very much uh, well, something that can be appealed to. I'll Look, I'm going to go out on the limb with you because because uh, 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 Amos in his book Beyond the Impasse talks uh -huh. about you know, a pneumatological theology of religions yeah. and how the spirit is at work in various cultures. Yes. Some of whom do not name the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he begins to identify what are the, 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 the pneumatological markers that we can see and identify within those cultures. And then... He presses against us and challenges us as Trinitarian Christians to say that most of us are not fully tri Trinitarian when we don't see the salvific dimensions of what the Holy Spirit could be doing in bringing about salvation when mm -hmm. we make a singular ap appeal to the way salvation was appropriated through Christ in, yeah. in every culture. And so I think that those things are important, but and it's and it's tough. And somebody's listening on the live stream today is saying, "Well, Bridge Bob, are you saying that that Jesus is not the only way to salvation?" No, what I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit is a co-equal aspect of the Trinity, which yeah. means that the, the Holy Spirit has to have salvific efficacy as well. Which means when the Holy Spirit is at work, the Holy Spirit is comfortable in some places that you and I, as formed Christians in a Western ideology, are oftentimes not comfortable in. Yeah, And so when the spirit is at work in those places, mm -hmm. I think that as Pentecostals and Charismatics, we're advantaged because we can we can do as scripture says, the one upon whom you see the spirit remain. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenging thing. And I, I don't want to uh, diminish how challenging it is because people want to want, as a result, to make sense of it. So so what um, are, are we saying that um, the people who, who have never heard of Jesus um, – uh, can be saved and, and it gets complicated with these 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 situations and these questions and I don't want to diminish how complicated it is at the same time it, it really doesn't make sense to me um, to say all right so all these millions if not billions of people who've never heard are somehow lost as a result right, right. Um, and I think that goes back to uh, a creational logic as you pointed out, that if if we all, not just Christians, if we all as human beings are created in the image of God, um, then there's something to be said for us as humans to have the imprint of God's uh, life and work somehow, right? Somehow. And so, you know, even uh, in Mike McClyman's uh, 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 two-volume, 1,100-page a 12 year study on, on, I mean, he writes this massive magnum opus on uh, in uh, universalism mm -hmm. um, and traces its historical and theological origins along that wise. He addresses even some of those dimensions. This is where our Pentecostal brother Carlton Pearson got in, uh, got in some, I think, I think the Carlton was just theologically inept and he didn't have the intellectual scaffolding to be able to express it in a more full way and, and 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 to be able to express it without disparaging and diminishing the christian tradition yeah, sure. and i think i can hold to the christian tr uh, position and still have the intellectual uh intellectual integrity and the courage the theological courage to be able to explore what possibilities salvific possibilities could yeah. exist mm -hmm. particularly if we take seriously the holy spirit's uh, uh co-equality in the yeah. in the trinity yeah. and if we take uh, seriously, the the work of the Spirit going out in in the world. Okay, uh, yeah, I, would say, I would say to that to those points, and and I'm and we're talking about these hypotheticals and these complicated circumstances as Christians, right? So it's it's within our location as Christians that very very particularity that we're trying to make sense of the wider universal aspects, and I just stress that point because oftentimes. Again, Western understandings tends to uh, diminish the particularity of those who are questioning. Let's just put it out there. We are Christians who are trying to make sense of these wider concerns. Um, yeah. And so it's not that we're standing out above the clouds 
but very much through this particularity, we're trying to make sense of the, these wider matters. Yeah. So let me draw in a, a, a renowned uh, Western uh, European theologian, uh, who uh, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who talks about this notion of Christ in culture, mm -hmm. Christ against culture, and ultimately Christ above culture, mm -hmm. so that our view of the Jesus of Scripture has to be through this prism of understanding when and how and how that shapes us in an, in you know in our imitatio Christi in our imitation of Christ um, mm -hmm. to be. Be, but but that discernment for me then has to be a spiritual discernment. It has to be someone in touch with the spirit to be able to know yeah. what, where what vantage point is Christ operating from, or where should we see him where that's concerned. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I didn't I didn't send that as a, as a question. No, it's a it's an interesting uh, proposal and became very dominant um, in the field of Christian ethics. And I would just say. Um, that that sense of offering a typology itself <laughs> is, is a yeah. Western sensibility. That you, have to, you have to have these five categories, and there can't be much mixture. There can't be. I confess, I'm more Western than I than I care to be. I confess. Forgot. We all, are. Me. <laughs> we all are. We're all. Strong. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The question itself reveals the theological and social location. I hear you, man. That's I right. hear you. That's right. Wow. Well, tell us. Okay, I've got a few more minutes for for dialogue, and then and then listen, friends. I want you to, if you're getting any value out of this, I want you to like and subscribe. I want you to make uh, comments. And now's the time for you, really. If you have questions, nothing is too nothing is uh, too elemental, and nothing is too. Uh, 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 heady for you to, to ask or to offer by way of comment or question. Please do that. And we'll, we'll look at those in the last 15 minutes. But I want to uh, get uh, uh, our friend, Dr. Costello, to, to speak on this, uh, this matter now. Now, this intersection, one of the things that you do in the text, and, and for those of you all that have not seen it as of yet, maybe you came on a little later, this is the book we're talking about. This is the author with whom we're speaking. Daniel Costello wrote Pentecostalism as a Christian mystical tradition. We're late to the party. Uh, it was published in 2017. And now we are uh, drinking deeply of its, uh, of its uh, nurture for us as a church. It is an academic book. And you will and uh, need, as I well, if you're like me, you will need to read it two and three times, uh, the chapters and sometimes the page, and really to really uh, uh, suck the marrow out of it to be able to understand both the historical significance and the trajectory in which he's leading us as Pentecostal people in uh, moving toward a more full understanding of our Pentecostalism, not as something uh, co uh, confined to the, the 20th century, uh, Zusa Street movement, or not as something of, of the last uh, 600 years of the, or 500 years of the Protestant Reformation, but, uh, but something much larger, much broader, much more far-reaching, more ubiquitous than that reality, okay? So if you have some thoughts, questions, please put them up there. But what I want you to say now is you, you take evangelicalism to task pretty strong. Yeah. And um, and so your polemic there suggests that of the multiple types of evangelicalism, that fundamentalist evangelicalism seems to, at the time of the writing, which I suspect was 2015, 2016, for a 2017 publication, seemed to be um, more aligned with fundamentalist sensibilities tracing back to the, as you have clearly articulated in the text, the early 1900s, in which a lot of things in our society were taking place. That's right. Not the least of which was the Azusa Street uh, 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 outpouring, but then there was also the women's suffrage movement. Yeah. There was the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. There were all sorts of, there were, there were uh, 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 legislation that was being passed and there were, there were advancement amongst peoples. And so then there's this marriage then with Pentecostalism yeah. and evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. And you took them to task on several things. How do you see, the reason I bring it up and, and give it this much of a preamble is because in 2015, 2016, when you were writing that, the cultural climate was different than it is today. So when I read that, I read that as prophetic. You were writing then toward a cultural reality that seemed to have gotten more 
uh, we can look at your text and say, this is what what Costello was talking about, and this didn't even exist when he wrote it. I'll stop there. Yeah, it's 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 difficult because um, you know evangelicalism is hard to define, as you say. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to define it, a lot of different currents. Um, one thing that I stress in the book, though, is that um, the kind of evangelicalism that um, is at, at work in the in the U.S. in the United States, um, very much uh, shaped by the 19th century. And there's a lot of things that we can say about the 19th century uh, in U.S. history, but one of the things that we can say, I, I think, is that um, it was a century of empire building. Sure. And sure. in an empire building, uh, you want to offer uh, proposals that vast people can subscribe to. Um, and, and you want to diminish dissent, and you want to um, create continuity, and so forth. And so, I think that there are currents in our current uh, situation. There are streams uh, coming from that 19th century, and um, so, intellectually speaking, right? There is this the sense that if we're building an empire, if we're trying to. Um, build consensus, and, and if we're really afraid of dissent, because we don't want to, uh, yeah, we are a country that emerges out of a revolutionary situation, uh, but we don't want constant revolutions, and we don't want a revolution like France, and so, yeah, we had this revolutionary period where we we're asking questions and, and resisting powers, but now we're going to build something that um, can, can, can a tower of sorts, right? A, a system. Um, and so what intellectual things can we appeal to to do that? And so I, I find that um, one of the things that, that was appealed to is a hard rationalism, uh, which truth is understood in a very particular way that you can think of it. I know this is a bit of a reduction, but you see it at times where you think that you can reduce things to propositions to almost like math, right? And since it, it, just like two plus two equals four, that you can also explain things like morality or, or spirituality and, and so forth. And what gets lifted up there at times, um, Christ is the word, right? Um, and the word of God, um, and Christ is the way to truth and the life and so forth. And so in all those transitions and all that, those desires to build something of an empire, I think what gets diminished considerably is not only dissent, uh, but tithe, I would say, uh, is also a, a prominent place for the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, when people think about these big questions like truth and, and goodness and God, um, you're going to be appealing to that, uh, that framework. And it's a framework, unfortunately, that makes very little uh, room for things like surprise, for confession, for humility, uh, and, and for change. Um, and dissent. And so as a result, I, I really pushed uh, to make a distinction between evangelicalism and Pentecostalism. And I know Bravo. that in Bravo. the history, Kudos to you. Kudos to you. Thank you. In, in the history, I understand that there are a lot of, uh, it's a messy entanglement. And, and I'm not trying, I'm not a purist saying that that we can separate things and that, uh, or an idealist and say that uh, really the true Pentecostalism is something different. But I, I just want to press the point that oftentimes in circles that label themselves as evangelicals, Pentecostals are not equal participants in the process, right? So what is the tension? And I think part of the tension is it's not just, you know, class. Uh, it's not just um, uh, education. Uh, but we're talking about something even deeper, uh, theologically and intellectually. Um, if, if we use Pentecostals and Charismatic, suggest that that our, our that, that we come before God and we can be changed and transformed, um, and that we have to protest, we have to prophesy, we have to resist. That's empire builders don't want don't want that, right? And so I I I really pressed this point back then. Um, because I saw it as problematic, and, and frankly, um, as things have played out over the last few years, uh, there has been this really a, a strong sense of of a, of a particular political party, a particular way of being Christian, aligning themselves for particular purposes. And I, I just I want to stress, all right, so the dissent, can, uh, where is it? Um, 
where, where are the marginalized voices? Um, it's, it's this consolidation or desire to consolidate power and, and, and various arrangements um, has led, I would say, to a diminishment of the vitality of Christian witness. And, and, and we need those who can speak outside of those domains, outside of those strivings for power uh, to say uh, the gospel is more than this, right? Mm. Um, I just, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate um, how people, for instance, associate uh, evangelicalism largely with, uh, right. with being Republican, with being white, uh, and, and so forth. And, and as right. a result, um, the, the, the witness of, of Christianity largely, and also the witness of evangelicalism, um, is diminished as a result. So I, I really want to stress um, and I was anticipating in the book, as you say, and of course, who, who could have anticipated what we've experienced over the last few years, but this sense that um, for Christianity to be vital, it has to be able to speak to the powers that be. And, um, and I think that that's, that's a fault oftentimes of evangelicalism in this country that's actually seeking the power uh, rather than trying to resist the power yes. of evangelicalism. Yes, and this co-opting of the terms kingdom of God with an understanding of American empire yeah. and this notion that everything can be uh, uh, put in a typological framework uh, and, and with a biblical narrative and some kind of biblical construct to support this empire. And this yeah. is how this should play out because this is what was happening in Scripture. It's, it's very injurious. And I, yeah. I just... For those of you all that share uh, some, many of you all share my sensibilities concerning, you know, social justice and, and prophetic witness. And Dr. Uh, Costello's work um, really does a great job of building a platform and a and a intellectual theological substratum, a constructive, creative theological substratum, to be able to. Uh, to critique and uh, a place, to, not just critique like criticize, but to critique, offer a full-throated, um, a sh humble critique. Um, uh, Dr. Swazet Mooring, who is a chemist by trade, teaches uh, at, at Georgia State University. I appreciate and relate to this perspective of the intersections of theology, spiritualism, and intellectualism. The, I, this idea of making room for other cultures, he's also Trinidadian, uh, other cultural perspectives and not putting God experiences in a box, yeah. which for me, I think you have articulated in this, in the, particularly in your last statements concerning um, concerning how uh, evangelicalism has been framed, the narrative around evangelicalism in yeah. these very recent years. Yeah. Um, and, not to, I mean, and, and not to mention uh, Pentecostalism's marriage in the 1940s to evangelicalism, yeah. when evangelicalism was certainly losing its steam and needing the kind of fervor and growth potential that Pentecostalism afforded. And so, you know, with Billy Graham and Pentecostals on board, well, I tell you that thing, it, it, it took on a whole nother trajectory. Yeah. So I think there's, let's see here. Um, again, uh, Bishop Kroon said, does academic slash theological grammar as it relates to an attempt to make sense of our experience potentially conflict with the vernacular of non-academic cultural experiences? If so, how do we bridge the conversational gap in order to have a real and meaningful spiritual discussion? So I'll leave that to you, good doctor. Well, we, if we suggest that theological grammars are reflective of cultural dynamics themselves, uh, then yeah, cultures um, will will have different accounts, will appeal to different authorities, will have different ways of of um, making sense of things. Um, so I, I want to stress even further from, from the comment, you know, it's, it's um, you know, theological grammars are cultural expressions. As they engage other cultural expressions, there are going to be times in which um, things are, are lost in translation or not understood and, and so forth. And so for me, um, I think it's important, and, and I tried to say this earlier, um, that with with theological grammars, um, there is potential um, for a, a kind of um, of um, of pride, intellectual pride uh, that mm. we have. We have mm. terms 
uh, and, and here, here are authorities that we can appeal to um, to make sense of these things. And uh, so that could be part of the conflict too. It's not just in terms of the terms, but in terms of the way of engagement, right? I know more uh, than, than somebody else does. And so therefore, uh, you might not have the language, but I can I can say, oh, you don't use that language. Well, let me give you the language that's true, or the language that's that's most helpful or more, more sophisticated. And so there's a lot of privilege. This is something that I really want to stress too. There's a lot of privilege with theological um, studies, with with academic theology, and we have to actively renounce that. I would say, how do we actively renounce it? We renounce it by saying that we are not the only ones who. Uh, can speak truthfully and faithfully of the God of our worship, right? And so if we can renounce that, that kind of privilege in that sense, uh, then when there, there are conflicts that happen and, and we're not making sense to one another because there's a different cultural expression at work um, than, than, than ours, well, that invites then uh, the possibility of true dialogue and exchange and of trying to really understand the other person and where they're coming from. And, and the goal being there, not so much to, to come to a, a, a set definition or to a set language, but to be able to, to, to um, bear our gifts one to another. And so that, that's, that's the way that I would see it, is that it's an opportunity uh, to, to learn from one another, from one another's cultural expressions and understandings. Um, for instance, something that, that I've been enjoying over the last um, a few weeks uh, in terms of um, uh, the, the pandemic, I've been reading a lot of stoicism <laughs> lately and uh, realizing, wow, there, there's some contributions to be made here. These are figures that lived 1,700 years ago. I'm not a stoic. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Christian problems with stoicism, but yet- if We're there's not a stoic by choice. The pandemic has given us all a, 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 a bit of an element of stoicism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and also, you know, with other traditions, uh, other religious traditions and so forth, there, there are gifts to be exchanged, right? Sure. But with the privilege that comes with academic theology, um, the thing that I worry as an academic is that somehow I assume for myself the ability to know more than the other person um, when they don't have that privilege. And, and I think that's, right. that's very problematic. Right. Because if we're really if we're talking about theology, nobody is an expert in a sense. Right, 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 and that that really grates up against Pentecostal sensibilities who believe that the Spirit can be poured out on any and all flesh, and Amen. Um, Amen. The Spirit yes. democratizes the work. Last last question, really important. Uh, uh, Dr. Freddie Marshall uh, uh, writes and says, "Thank you for this presentation. Can Dr. Costello expand on his thoughts?" Uh, from the book where he lifts the argument that, Pente quote, Pentecostalism represents a particular kind of resurgence. And I think that the key word in the sentence is the, the notion of resurgence mm -hmm. of the mystical dimensions of Christianity within the Western global context and globally as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not prone to say that I understand all of what's happened historically, but I find it very fascinating um, that, um, you know, when you look at the humble beginnings of, uh, now to, to be a little Azusa-centric, but the humble beginnings of uh, the Azusa meeting and the impact that it had, right, in terms of mission, uh, in terms of, of renewal, um, it, it, it's a fascinating um, uh, uh, situation to account for in that, so Spirit's doing something um, among people in that environment. Spirit's doing things in other contexts too. Uh, what's the spirit up to, right? And if I, if I could be a little bold, uh, I, I would say that um, something is pretty, uh, transpiring pretty significantly across the globe. I mean, if you look at Philip Jenkins, Absolutely. the things that he's talking about globally, uh, we're talking about renewals, revivals of a massive scale that we've never seen before. Mm. And what, what, what is happening? Um, it's, it's not necessarily clear, but I, I think there's something pretty funny about this. Uh, and that is that uh, I, I tend to think of it as a kind of judgment on Western Christianity uh, wow. in, in the sense that, wow. um, you know, you have uh, 
churches closing down in the West. I went to Scotland a few years ago uh, to get some lectures at, at a university there. And so they were showing me throughout the town and I saw this really ancient building and it looked like a church, but um, there was some wild music coming out and I thought, well, is this a <laughs> Pentecostal charismatic church? What's going on? Because it was loud, right? And, and there were lights and so forth. And I asked my host, what, what's, what's, what's happening with that building? And he said, Oh, well, that used to be a Church of Scotland um, a building, uh, but the church is declining so much uh, that the church had to sell it off, and some people buy it, and they converted it into a disco, into a wow. dance club. And I, I, it just opened my eyes to the reality that um, here you have all this renewal, all this revival happening on a global scale. Mm -hmm. and and in, in the context that we're familiar with, there's, there's, there's the, these repeated claims of decline. What's going on? And I think it's that uh, the Spirit uh, is, is saying to us that, um, you know, it's not all about um, being a Westerner. It's not all about uh, 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 the colonial plot project, uh, the, the, the project of empire. Uh, the spirit's not limited to those things. And in fact, uh, it's the global church that might have to uh, teach uh, uh, the Western church uh, uh, or two, what it means to hear God's voice and to attend the things of God. And so I, I think it's a... It's, uh, it, the, these movements that we're seeing, it's a resurgence, right? Because it's not, it's the same God. And so there, there are mm -hmm. patterns to be mm -hmm. known. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but I, I think that the, the project of modernity, the project of empire has worn itself out to some degree. And we're starting to see the cracks uh, of that project and, and God's uh, working to judge it, I believe, and, and God's working to uh, renounce it. And we see that uh, in these various uh, instances through the revival and the growth that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a, it's if I could say this one more thing, uh, sure. I, was a, I was in a meeting in Oxford uh, um, a couple of summers ago, and these were Methodists, and everybody there was talking about how they're Methodist from the global church. Everybody was talking about how, what, are we all turning Pentecostals now? Because the, the churches in Latin America, the churches in Africa that were Methodist churches, they, they by their confession, they were looking like Pentecostal churches, people speaking in tongues and exorcisms and miracles and so forth. So I just think it's it's a it's a it's a pretty fascinating moment we're living in in which the spirit is and really that's that resurgence. That's that resurgence that's of the right, right. tradition. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. I'll have to bring you back on. Good doctor. I have to bring you back. Listen, uh, Daniel Costello's my friend. I don't we, nobody gets paid to come on here. It, these kind of lectures, this kind of opportunity to sit at his feet and learn. The way I want you to help me is I want you to purchase his book, write this title, purchase his book. It's on Erdman's Publishers. You can get it on Amazon. Pentecostalism as a Christian mystical tradition. I'm going to leave this up here for a moment because I want you to go purchase his book. Go to Amazon.com, go to the publisher and purchase his book it will be a blessing as you, as uh, we expand and uh, take this uh, this kind of conversation further. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Bishop Alexander. Thank you, Dr. May. Thank you, Deacon Juanita. Thank you all, uh, Sister Deborah. Thank you all, Bishop Fred, uh, Freddie Marshall. Thank you all, Bishop Kroon. All of you are, Dr. Tony. All of you for being on on tonight and sharing this time with us and contributing so greatly and wonderfully by way of this live stream and being able to uh, think through and discuss and hear both the claims of scripture and theology. And, um, and uh, <laughs> Dr. Swazet Borg says, uh, hey, my, my friend and son, Michael Young, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you bought your copy already. Look forward to reading it. Good for you. And, uh, and good. Dr. Mooring says, uh, uh, Dr. Costello, uh, Dr. Swazet Mooring says we need to we need to have an after dialogue. She wants us to 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 keep on going, C cut the stream off, but we keep talking. Lord have mercy, y'all go on and buy the book. Uh, 
Please, ma'am, please, sir, make it your business to purchase the book, make it your business to read the book, engage with this constructive and creative theological uh, uh, proposition that Dr. Costello brought to the table three or four years ago. And now I see and we see, can see the, the idea of it being further and further, uh, uh, particularly this last thing we're talking about, Pentecostalism, evangelicalism, the, 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 the connectedness therein. Thank you, thank you, thank you for spending this hour and 15 minutes with us on tonight. To you. Thank it's you. a great privilege to be here. Thank you, Dr. Alvarado. And this book was a labor of love. And so I, um, and ultimately it's to help the church. So I, I, I thank you so much uh, for having me on here. You're very welcome. Hold on, hold on. I'm, I, don't, I don't see it. Oh my goodness. One of our teachers, Dr. Cheryl Bridges Johns, has been listening to us. Every time anybody I've ever studied under listens to anything I have to say, I feel like I'm being graded again. But <laughs> I love her so much. Dr. Johns, you and Jackie Johns, have, I, we Tony and I told you years ago how much of an influence and impact you have on our lives. Thank you for taking time to be on this conversation with us. What a blessing it has, has been to have you on there. Thank you, Dr. Ray Mori. Thank you one and all for being a part of the Global Pentecostal Perspectives live stream on tonight. I appreciate each and every one of you and look for us next Saturday night with another great conversation on from Global Pentecostal Perspectives. Mm -hmm.